Welcome to CSIS online event. Today we're going to be talking about Russian influence in the United Kingdom. This conversation is actually part of a broader report that CSIS just produced that looks at how to counter Russian and Chinese influence. So last Thursday, we held a conversation with former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull that looked at Chinese influence in Australia. Part of the report examined Japan and Australia and how Chinese influence works there. Today's conversation is to look at how Russian influence works in the United Kingdom. As part of that broader work, we also looked at Germany. The reason that Malcolm Turnbull was so important is because we used his framing of influence activities. We looked at covert, coercive, and corrupting influence factors. Many reports have certainly examined the supply of influence activities, but very few look at the demand side, how democracies use and accept these influence activities. So our report focused much more on the demand. How do democratic governments and societies internalize that influence activities? This report was made possible by the State Department's Global Engagement Center through the Information Access Fund uh, and administered by the DT Institute. And we're grateful, of course, for their support. But these views, of course, are the authors and not of the State Department's. So if I may, let me briefly go over some of the key findings from this report. Russia and China certainly have different objectives uh, in how they use their influence activities, but they share one commonality. They both try to divide the United States from its most important allies, and certainly the United Kingdom is America's most essential or one of the most essential allies. They do this by using their influence activities to look at how democracies, how they divide societies. So we looked at societal cohesion. We looked at the use of the diaspora community. We looked at the economic interconnectedness. That was a big key. How, did the, how does money corrupt or capture elite? And then, of course, we looked at the media, how social media was uh, interacting and regulating the types of influence activities that Russia was perpetuating within the United Kingdom. The scope of this report fell outside the coronavirus pandemic, but of course, near the end of our reporting, we saw a more disturbing trend. That was China emulating Russia's tactics. Whereas Russia tries to divide society and basically degrade democracy and faith in democratic institutions, China attempts to coerce and, and try to suppress any criticism of China. But all of a sudden, we're starting to see China take on the appearances of more Russian influence activities. So those are the, the uh, overriding uh, key findings of the report. We invite you to take a look at that final report. So now let's dive deep into the UK. Uh, we could not have put together a, a more fantastic group of colleagues to speak about Russian influence activities in the United Kingdom. Let me first introduce Dame Karen P Pierce, British Ambassador to the United Kingdom. Ambassador Pierce arrived uh, earlier in the spring, and of course, we went into lockdown. But we welcome you to uh, Washington, Ambassador Pierce, uh, formerly uh, British Ambassador to the United Nations and former uh, UK Special Representative to Afghanistan. We also have with us Luke Harding, the senior international correspondent for The Guardian and author of a new book entitled Shadow State, uh, Murder, Mayhem, and Russia's Remaking of the West that's uh, now um, out. Uh, and we thank Luke for joining us from London. Uh, and then, of course, we have our very own Rachel Elhus, Deputy Director of the Europe Program at CSIS and Senior Fellow, the, the author of the UK uh, chapter for this report. And no one is better uh, at helping uh, moderate this conversation. They say timing is everything. And I believe this conversation couldn't be more well-timed because we're told tomorrow uh, the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee, uh, Committee of the UK Parliament, will be releasing its much anticipated uh, report on Russian interference in the, U in the UK. And perhaps we can use this conversation as a good framing for when that report is released tomorrow. So with that, 
Thank you to our colleagues. Uh, please read the report. Again, I'm Heather Conley from CSIS, and we, we're grateful that you're here. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'll just offer some brief remarks about what we saw in the UK case study and then turn it over to you, Ambassador Pierce, uh, before we go into a discussion. But when we looked at the UK case study, we saw two Russian objectives in particular. The first was to weaken the UK internally. So this was um, magnified in things like ex accentuating existing, existing divisions between leave and remain, um, rural and urban divides, even, even those in, in Scotland who preferred to, to separate from the United Kingdom rather than remain. So the first objective was to weaken the UK internally. The second was a related objective, um, and that was to diminish the UK's place in the world. So the influence activities that fell in this bucket were related to NATO, the European Union, and the relationship with the United States. So clearly Russia recognized that the UK is made even stronger by its, its membership in NATO, um, and until recently the European Union, and its uniquely close relationship with the United States. So those were targets of the influence activities as well. Um, but what we found in looking in the study was that it wasn't so much the objective or tactics in either the Russia or China case that made the real difference in terms of influence and impact. Rather, it was what happened on the receiving end. How resilient was the society um, or the country that was on the receiving end of, of these tactics and objectives? And in many ways, the UK was, was very resilient. The government is accountable. Um, it's highly transparent. There's a good balance um, among the different branches of government. Your media landscape is very resilient. I was, I was um, impressed to see that 50% of UK citizens are getting the majority of their news from the BBC. Uh, and the diaspora community, which can often be a vulnerability, was relatively well integrated and well off and, and did not present as a vulnerability in the UK case. However, we did find two vulnerabilities that were particular to the UK case that I hope we can dive into a bit. The first was regul regulatory gaps. In particular, um, the campaign finance law created some loopholes that, that possibly um, led to um, more, more foreign money coming into the campaign. Of course, we've, we've got no proof of that, but that is, that is essentially um, where some of the trails led us. Uh, the UK also has a very in, in, interesting structure with the crown dependencies um, and some of the overseas, te overseas territories. So even when these regulatory gaps were fixed in the UK proper, they manifested themselves and the, and the legislation was, was implemented later um, in those two instances. The second vulnerability was, were societal vulnerabilities, which I alluded to in the beginning. So um, a polarization, whether it's political or ideological, that we see across um, the United States and Europe. But certainly, those were the two vulnerabilities that jumped out in the UK case. Um, and smartly, I think, in the UK response, they tried to address those vulnerabilities through changes in the campaign finance law, for example, um, through efforts to increase media literacy or the ability to, to identify disinformation and misinformation. So while I think we're on a very positive track, um, certainly the tactics continue to change um, and so the response has to evolve. Uh, and with that, I think I'd like to turn the floor over to Ambassador Pierce to give us your impressions of, um, you know, essentially when did the UK become a target of Russia? Why did they become a target of Russia? Um, and, and what are you generally seeing both with regard to influence activities in the UK as well as the UK's experience um, watching influence activities overseas? Thank you, Ambassador Pierce. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much, Heather. And, and, and thank you, Rachel. And thank you for inviting me uh, to join this very interesting discussion. I think the first thing to say is that the UK and Russia actually have a very long history uh, and at points in this history uh, we have had very good relations. One goes back over 300 years, Peter the Great, uh, and that was um, a stage of the relationship uh, that for those times was very productive. Uh, we admire the Russian people uh, and we recognize the enormous sacrifices uh, that the Russian people made uh, in the Second World War. And we appreciate the fact uh, 
that that Second World War was won uh, with Soviet uh, assistance and the Soviet Union uh, was an ally at that time. And we've always made it clear that we want a productive, load-bearing relationship uh, with the Russian government, uh, including the current uh, Russian government. Uh, and I went with uh, Boris Johnson when he was Foreign Secretary uh, to Moscow uh, to deliver that last message, uh, which seemed at the time uh, to be appreciated by our Russian hosts. However, uh, three months after that, saw the GRU poisonings in Salisbury and the Sweepel case, and eventually led to more than 150 Russian diplomats uh, being expelled uh, across Europe and the United States uh, by the UK uh, and its partners. Um, so I think that the fundamental question uh, has to be, why does Russia reject these overtures uh, that countries like the UK, but there are others, uh, make in terms of a load-bearing relationship? We're never going to always agree with Russia. We're often not going to agree on a huge number of subjects, uh, but we are both permanent five members at the Security Council, uh, and we do have certain interests in global stability. Uh, and that ought to be a good foundation for some productive, uh, even if difficult, conversations. Uh, but we don't see Russia uh, behaving as a permanent five member. Uh, we see Russia doing all the things you've just described and more uh, in Georgia and other countries uh, besides the UK. Uh, and we also see her condoning, if not abetting, the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Chemical weapons are a universal, universally prohibited uh, weapon. So why does a permanent five member uh, want to allow uh, one of its uh, client states uh, to use such an awful weapon? And I think the Russia of the uh, Cold War, if you like, the Soviet Union of the Cold War, uh, would have seen that as crossing a line in terms of stability. So I think this comes, Rachel, to your question of how long has this been uh, going on. And I'm not a historian. I haven't looked into it in detail. But I think anecdotally, all these things we're seeing are synonymous uh, with the rise of President Putin. Uh, and there's something important in that, I think. Uh, there's something about this uh, mantra that the Russians have of the end of the West. You know, they're out to show that Western values don't count anymore. Uh, the Western approach to trade doesn't count anymore. The Western approach to international treaties and international norms and standards doesn't count uh, anymore. And they're putting a lot of effort into undermining all that. Uh, and then, as you say, uh, we come to the United Kingdom uh, and all the things uh, that you've described. Uh, we try in the United Kingdom to be resilient against those uh, attacks. We've set up uh, a number of um, programs like Defending Democracy and Countering Disinformation uh, to make us more resilient and use all the parts of um, British institutions. Uh, but as you also say, some of these arguments uh, by the Russians are pernicious. Uh, we all know how they affect uh, opinion polls. And um, I come back to my First point, uh, why does Russia want to behave like this? Why not just have a more productive relationship with the West? The West is no threat uh, to Russia. Uh, so why not take a different uh, Euro-Atlantic route as in the um, late 1990s it seemed possible uh, that Russia might do? So I think that's, that's an important question which we should keep confronting uh, Russian uh, representatives with. Um, I think the second point of Russia-China links, I think these are very interesting and intriguing. Um, I doubt very much it's a partnership of two equals, uh, but at the same time I do wonder if the Russians are um, more manipulative uh, with the Chinese than perhaps the Chinese realise. Uh, and I think the whole disinformation thing, where as you say we've seen the Chinese copying Russian patterns of disinformation, uh, including vis-a-vis -vis, 
uh, UK policy. Uh, I think that's an interesting area to explore. Uh, I'll stop there so you can ask questions or, or move on to Luke, but uh, very happy to elaborate on any of that. Thank you. I think that's very insightful about um, you know, your, your analysis that Russia feels that it has more to gain from being disruptive than from engaging and trying to um, think about why that might be the case. Um, certainly there are certain rules and norms that are inviolable, but, but beyond that, I think there's scope for thinking about how we change that calculus. And, mm -hmm. and certainly mm -hmm. Russia's not alone in, in that. A number of other countries um, Heather and I just look closely at Turkey, and, and Turkey is certainly making the same calculation in its region that it has more to gain um, from acting unilaterally or, or pushing its agenda rather than engaging with, with EU and NATO partners for a more collective uh, end state. So I think that's a very sharp observation. Um, before I turn it over to Luke, maybe just one more question to, to keep the flow going. I mean, Russia really has doubled down on these, these efforts that fall below the threshold of armed conflict. I mean, we, we looked at the Brexit referendum, the Scottish independence referendum, and possibly even the UK elections. When, when you observe these in retrospect, do you really think that these efforts have had impact? Um, we struggled with this in, in the study very much. We could see influence, but we, we really couldn't necessarily say um, because there was this point of influence or involvement, it led to this outcome. In your experience, um, maybe even looking um, at, at, at the UK's engagement in, in Central Europe, do you think that these efforts have impact? Oh, I think that's a really good question. As you say, it's quite hard to measure, and it may be that we're all too close to it to know uh, if it will have had uh, impact. So I think if one wanted to look at impact, um, the East Europeans uh, have more experience uh, of the Russian government, uh, if you like, than, than anyone else. And they certainly uh, worry about the cumulative effect uh, as well as individual decisions. So there may be something quite important in um, Russian attempts to destabilize uh, over time that we can't quite discern yet. Um, I do think it was well said of of the Russian government, uh, that they put the saber in until they hit steel. Uh, and I always thought in, in the UN that the Russians have, as good chess players, uh, at least two strategies uh, for any given venture. And uh, one is, if you like, is incremental, and the other is, is much more dynamic. And they will pursue either of those depending on circumstance. So they're very adept at jumping from circumstance to circumstance and advancing their agenda as fast as those circumstances uh, allow. And I think the um, consequence of that or the implication of that is that to halt them, we have to be very firm early on. They have to hit that steel with the saber early on. And I think that's where sometimes collectively uh, the West is not always as forceful uh, with Russia as, as we might be. Uh, and I do think a, a bigger conversation about Russian tactics uh, in this regard would be helpful. Uh, because I think if we aren't alert to this Russian strategy of riding two horses, uh, we end up with the risk that we inadvertently let something happen that then has a consequence uh, we weren't expecting. So uh, that's definitely uh, worth conversation. Uh, and in many ways, I'd, I'd like NATO to, to have these conversations because that's where uh, collective security uh, resides. Um, but on the whole, I think the British public is pretty resilient. You know, as you say, people get their news uh, from authoritative and objective, independent, but uh, well-renowned uh, outlets like the BBC and the national uh, press. Uh, there's a healthy scepticism, I think, uh, in the British public, which is useful on these occasions. Uh, and I think the Russian message is so obviously anti-democratic uh, that it goes against a lot of traditions. So people, again, uh, are sceptical. Uh, I think it's interesting, going back to the first point, you know, the Russians obviously can't get their message across by democratic means. Uh, that ought to tell them something. They're irrational, clever people. Um, but in terms of actual impact versus influence, I come back to the point that I think we're just a bit too close to it uh, to know if that, that would be the case. 
Thank you. Well, Luke, you've, you've looked at a lot of these, these issues and of impact and vulnerabilities and what makes an influence activity more or less successful, uh, in quotes, um, if you will. What, in your experience, um, should we be studying? Um, how can we reduce the likelihood that we'll see these influence activities um, occurring in the future? And if they do, how do, we, how do we go about making sure that the impact or the influence is reduced? Yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Congratulations on a terrific report. It, it's been a pleasure to read and very timely. Um, just listening to, to, to the ambassador, um, I was put in mind of a conversation I had with a, with a British diplomat soon after I got kicked out of Moscow after four years there as the Guardian's correspondent in 2011. Uh, and it was, it was a pretty dispiriting experience which followed break-ins by the secret police at our apartment, uh, and a whole sort of series of harassment. And the diplomat said to me that the problem with the Russians is they don't think the way we think they should think. Uh, and, and that really goes to the heart of it, to, to, your, to your question, is that Putin, in my view, ultimately, unfortunately, is not interested in mutually beneficial solutions. He, he is a classic zero-sum guy who would rather have kind of lose-lose than win-win. Um, and in addition to that, he, he really sees the world, he sees geopolitics, he sees international alliances um, through a kind of KGB prism. And he, even though the Soviet Union is gone and communism is gone, he, his thinking almost sort of genetically is, is very KGB. And, and in this kind of worldview, which is paranoid, uh, conspiratorial, sees Russia as a besieged fortress surrounded by NATO and other hostile enemies, um, the, the United States is, is, the, is the main adversary, is the, is the Glavny Protivnik in, in, in Russian, and, and the UK is a kind of lesser main adversary, kind of bound together. Um, and I think what Putin has done with, 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 with some success in, in recent years is to take this old Soviet playbook of disruption, of undermining the enemy, of um, taking advantage of, of weaknesses in Western society, and he sort of shined it up for our age of Facebook and Twitter uh, and social media. Um, and you know, I think it's important that we don't exaggerate how powerful and omnipotent Vladimir Putin is. I mean, he isn't, he's, he's not a villain uh, sitting in a cave, uh, pressing buttons and making things happen in, 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 in DC or in London or in Berlin or wherever. But what I would argue is that he is a, a sort of classic KGB adventurist and opportunist. Um, and he, he tries stuff out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the, the problem is that his two most successful uh, operations, I would say, both took place in 2016. They were both related. What, one was the, um, uh, the push by, by Russian spy agencies to, to the sort of systematic and sweeping operation to help Donald Trump win the White House. Um, and, and the other was, was to, to actually launch a sort of comparable, pretty multifaceted operation to support the Leave campaign um, in the 2016 EU referendum, and also to some degree the Scottish independence referendum as well. And, and so we, you know, it's very hard to say, I mean, I wouldn't argue that Putin caused these results. Of course, there were, there were numerous other factors. But the point is, we have a very narrowly contested result, a sort of 50-50 scenario, and you have a troll operation by uh, social media bots sitting in St. Petersburg. You have uh, uh, sort of you have Russian intelligence officers based in London running around liaising with senior figures in the Leave campaign, and you also have the unanswered question of of financing. All, all sides deny wrongdoing, but but there's a genuine question raised by MPs, British MPs, and others about the covert funding of the Leave campaign. Um, it, it was a pretty kind of potent combination. And I would just say one other uh, thing, which is that my frustration as an investigative journalist is that, that I, I mean, the, the ambassador is right, that, 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 that it's perhaps too early to tell how much influence there has been. But in Britain, at least, we have not had a, a kind of proper reckoning. We haven't had a, a full interrogation of what happened in 2016. We're expecting with, 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 with great curiosity, this Russia report tomorrow from British Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee. 
But but to be honest, the way I see it is there's been a there's been kind of denialism uh, from a lot of politicians, uh, but particularly the current uh, government, which really Brexit is their project, and and they're they're pretty reluctant to acknowledge the Russians did anything around Brexit, even if to say that it was small and unimportant. Um, and I would just say lastly. The, the thing about Putin's influence operations, w- whether it's hackers or trolls or whatever, is he, he's an equal opportunity meddler. Uh, the, the, the vector in communist times uh, was, was far left parties, communist parties in France, Italy, the UK, America and elsewhere. Now his kind of preferred partner on the European stage is the far right. The, so Eurosceptic forces, Putin hates the European Union, which is why he welcomes Brexit. And, and if you're a politician of whatever stripe, you have to acknowledge that what may benefit you today may hinder you tomorrow. Uh, so it's everybody's problem and we all need to address it. Thank you, Look, I, I think that's an important point you've made. When we looked at the Germany case, certainly one of, one of the parties that the Russians were courting was AfD um, and, and Die Linke on the other side. And what they were essentially trying to do is to play on those margins to gain influence. Um, But in the German case, at least, the problem was is, you know, there may have been influence, but then the people they had tried to influence didn't hold seats in Parliament. So it never really carried over. Um, So it's important to follow follow those chains of of influence and logic. I also appreciated your point about um, not thinking that that Russia's under every rock, um, because certainly one of the objectives of influence activities is to undermine or paint as uncredible our media and our judiciary. So in many ways, I'm I'm hopeful that the report will shine a light on what is or or is not um, Russian influence activities. Um, If I I may ask um, a question uh, to the ambassador uh, briefly, you made an important point about um, the importance of the fact that Russia pushes until it hits steel and then it backs off. Um, in, in your experience, have, have we seen examples in the UK um, where there's been a response that's been forceful enough to make Russia think twice? And how can we leverage those best practices in the future um, if we do see another incident? Oh, that's, um, that's a tricky uh, question to answer on an open, um, in an open uh, environment. Uh, not least because it might alert the Russians to uh, the way we, we go about these things. But let, let me try and answer. So um, I think they were surprised by the strength of the Skripal response, uh, not just from the UK, but also uh, from uh, other countries. As I say, over 150 Russian diplomats were expelled across um, a number of countries. Uh, sanctions were put on Russia, the US in particular, Uh, increased its sanctions. And I don't think the uh, Russians expected the hard time uh, they got at the UN and in the Security Council. Uh, And of course, I I was involved in that. Um, And they didn't expect to be exposed for stealing the data later. That's something uh, we and the Dutch uh, uncovered. And they didn't expect to lose uh, the subsequent votes Um, in the chemical weapons uh, organization about future investigations. Uh, That's called OPCW. Uh, So I think all of those have have caused a little bit of a a retreat. I mean, it's only buying time, I think. If that, they're very good at regrouping, as as Luke was explaining, and using uh, lots of different tools. Um, As you know, we've just announced that uh, we believe Russian actors, that doesn't mean the Russian state, um, were involved uh, in the last general election campaign. Uh, we believe they're responsible uh, for leaking the papers on the free trade agreement uh, with the United States. Uh, and we um, have attributed uh, to the Russian uh, intelligence services uh, the work they were doing to try and steal uh, vaccines uh, information. So I'm hoping that all of those will have set them back. Um, I fear, but this is speculation, that they will divert their attention to uh, other countries whose internal systems uh, might not be quite so uh, robust. Um, It was well said of the Russian intelligence services that they'd rather steal uh, the weather report 
off the newscaster's desk than wait two minutes uh, until it was broadcast to the world. So there is something uh, in their psyche about the importance of secrets. Um, but hopefully with all these things and with a uh, much greater airing of the problem, including through sessions like this, uh, hopefully that provides some counter uh, to their ability to have any successes. Thank you, Ambassador. Luke, do you want to pick up on that? Because as an investigative journalist, I'm sure you've been an astute observer of, of what works in terms of pushback, but also in terms of anticipation. Um, I think going forward, that, that's something that, that, the, that the UK government is, has, has tried to be better at, is anticipating what the next event may be. But could you share your observations with us? Yeah, no, no it's, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it's interesting because I think the, the, the London's kind of uniquely placed to do something about Russian misbehavior. And, and the reason is that there's a tremendous amount of elite Moscow money, which is hidden in the UK or incorporated through British companies or, or stuffed in, in Crown dependencies or the British Virgin Islands and so on. Um, and actually, when you sort of think about malign Russian behavior, it, it, it's too easy to fall into the trap that th these are kind of faraway baddies about whom we know not a, not so much. Uh, and the problem is actually the, cor the corruption is on our doorstep. And, and this is one of the more, more contentious aspects, I think, of the Russia report, which we get tomorrow, um, which is some of the evidence which was submitted by Bill Browder, who's quite a well-known sort of American-British financier. He, he complained to the ISC, to this committee, about what he called a Western buffer network. And by that, he meant very rich Russians, quite often with Kremlin connections, who are um, PR people, who are um, real estate people, lawyers, company formation agents, um, and essentially are able to um, steal, to, to, to call it how it is, in Moscow, and, and then really kind of launder this money via Western financial networks through London and launder their reputations as well. Um, it, now, it, it's been a problem that's affected all governments. It didn't begin last year. It's, it's been going on for some time. And, and I think th this, this regime, the, the sort of regime of Vladimir Putin is uniquely vulnerable in a way that its Soviet predecessors were not. I mean, if you were, if you were a Politburo bureaucrat back in the, the late 1970s, you, you had an apartment in, in Moscow with a slightly higher ceiling. You had a chauffeur-driven car and you went, you went to holiday on the Black Sea and that, that was it. The people around Putin are all multi-billionaires. They, they have yachts moored off Corsica. They, they have a wine collection in Switzerland. Their kids are studying in London. Um, and well, well, I, I mean, I, I would personally kind of welcome what the Foreign Secretary, the British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab did last week with a Magnitsky list with designating human rights abusers following on from the US example, example of US Congress. But I think we could go so much further. Um, and we kind of need to recognize that, that Russian influence isn't, isn't necessarily done by generals wearing military, olive military uniforms with epaulets. It, it's done via rather charming people who speak fluent English, who are oligarchs, who are businessmen, who, who read the same novels that you and I read. Um, and it, it's, it's deceptive, but the, the goal is the same. And, and so I think London, London could do an awful lot more. And just lastly, I would say, I mean, I worked on a lot of quite important investigations with the New York Times and with other kind of international partners. I did the Panama Papers. Uh, we, we found so many people in Putin's circle who had offshore structures, um, but, but being helped by, by British professionals to set them up. Um, and it, it, if we're serious about um, stopping, deterring rogue uh, Kremlin behavior, th then actually conventional diplomatic response isn't necessarily the answer. I mean, it's a, it's a good first step, but the thing they really care about, despite their hyper-patriotism at home and their talk about Crimea and all the rest of it, is, is their offshore bank accounts. And once you target those, that, that is the steal that Ambassador Pierce is talking about. That's a wonderful response. And, you know, at the risk of, of plugging another CSIS report, um, Heather and colleagues did look at, at, did a comprehensive report called the Kremlin Playbook, and then there was a second version and the second version looked specifically at enablers. So countries that, that enabled um, Russian money, however it was achieved to go into bank accounts, real estate purchases, um, 
companies that were incorporated under under sort of shell ownership um, arrangements. So certainly that exists not only in the UK, but across Europe. Um, I, I'm reassured that the UK is on to this, particularly with the unexplained wealth ordinances that it's trying to issue, um, sort of ask the question is, how did you come by all these chalets and houses across the world. Um, and so I, I, I think the UK is going on the right track. Um, Madam Ambassador, did you want to respond to that? And then I think we'll turn to questions from the audience because we have quite a few. Uh, well, thank you, Rachel. Just quickly, I think Luke's uh, absolutely right. As you say, we've done a number uh, of things. We've switched the burden of proof um, in the unexplained wealth orders so people have to explain how they've got the money. We've got these um, human rights sanctions that also allow for assets freezes as well as travel bans. Uh, it's much harder now to launder money through things like property, uh, precious stones. Uh, we've got a special economic crime center uh, within our national uh, crime agency, which looks at things like this. Uh, we're trying to do more on transparency of overseas ownerships, uh, and we've helped crown dependencies and overseas territories uh, to get their registers and legislation in, in order. So uh, it's a huge task for the reasons Luke was explaining, um, but we are trying very much uh, to get on top of that and share good practice uh, with, with other countries. But I think it's also uh, a case of ceaseless vigilance. You know, we can't let up on doing any of this. Thank you. I, I think that highlights that we're at the beginning and we have a lot of good initiatives, but quite a lot to go. So turning to, to some questions from the audience, I, I'm trying to group them as we talk into different categories. And there is a lot of interest in, in what the UK and other democracies can do to help spread the, stop the spread of Russian influence in, in the Balkans, in Ukraine. Um, and, and there's a couple of questions asking specifically about influence in Bosnia, Montenegro, and, and North Macedonia. Um, in your experience, Ambassador, are there things that the UK has done or should continue doing to curtail that influence? Um, and then, um, Luke, maybe if you've looked at this from a, from a European angle, are there things that the European Union could be doing um, to address this, this influence in third countries? Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about this idea of, of a backdoor, that if you meet resistance in the UK or Germany, you'll just try another NATO ally or, or EU member state. Uh, over to you, Ambassador, and then Luke, just pick up quickly from there. Uh, great, thanks. Yes, I think um, the Russians are resurgent in the Balkans, notably in, in Serbia. You know, they've tried this coup in Montenegro that failed. Uh, they've tried meddling in Macedonia that failed. Uh, and that's all good. And you've seen both the EU and NATO move uh, to help those countries be more resilient, including through uh, expanding their own programs and a route to, to membership for them. Uh, Serbia, I think, because of its history and its links to uh, the Soviet Union, is genuinely quite ambivalent uh, about Russia versus the West. And uh, this is a massive generalization, but in, in general terms, Bosnia, I think, is very vulnerable. Um, and that's because of the fragility uh, of the Bosnian state in so many ways that we're familiar with. Uh, but how do we counter it? I think we've got to keep strengthening uh, EU and NATO and OSCE ties with those countries. Uh, we've got to help them uh, be very transparent uh, in their own legislation and the ways they uh, tackle the money laundering and the interference. Uh, that means, I think, uh, giving them more military training, more security training, more economic uh, training, uh, and probably more um, governance support uh, so that they find it easier uh, to resist some of the pernicious things uh, that the Russians do. Uh, I think it also means us all calling it out when we see it. Uh, if you remember the coup in Montenegro, the failed Russian coup in Montenegro uh, got a lot of um, publicity, and I think that's probably uh, an important deterrent. Uh, and then I think there is something about sharing best practice uh, and making sure we all come together uh, to talk about these issues behind closed doors so that we can map out what sorts of measures uh, might help countries uh, be more resilient. Um, and then, you know, I'd like to add talking to the Russians themselves about this, but they are very hard to have conversations with at the moment.
I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I would just, just add two, two quick points. W one is that the, the playbook, whether it's in Montenegro or Bosnia or, or, or wherever, tends to be the same in terms of kind of Russian ingress into, into, into countries. And, and what one, one route in is to buy up distressed assets. Quite often that involves media assets. You buy newspapers and then you kind of flip them. You, you buy strategic industries which are in trouble. Uh, and then you try and make inroads into the kind of political class. Uh, that, that's been happening all, all over the place. And so I think I, I, inward investment, we need to be um, a, a little bit cautious of sometimes. And the other thing is I would just e echo the ambassador's point um, about the GRU. Um, it, it's a very secretive organization behind the Salisbury poisoning. Um, it kind of exists in the shadows, or at least it did. I think it's been very stung by recent revelations and, and by some wonderful reporting by Bellingcat, the, the open source investigative uh, outfit. But what we now know is pretty dis distressing. We know since Salisbury that, 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 that there's been an undercover GRU diversionary unit based in the French Alps, traveling all over Europe, going to Switzerland, going to the Balkans, going to, to Bulgaria, um, get, going to UK for the Skripal operation of professional assassins. Uh, and the more we can, we can reveal their activities, the greater one would hope uh, that, that, that they think twice before doing something like that again. Thanks, Luke. Um, I recognize we're coming to the end of our time, but, but if, if, we, if we could just take one more question and, and maybe end on an optimistic note, and I put this to both of you. Um, we've noted that, that right now Russia's calculation is it has more to gain from this, this disruptive behavior, um, maintaining this zero-sum mentality. But are there certain pre prerequisites for deconfliction? Are there certain steps we could take on either side um, to start to get the relationship back on a more productive path, um, whereby Russia doesn't feel the need um, to take these, these covert steps? Do you, do you want me to go first, Rachel? Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, okay. I should have directed that. No, no, sorry. Apologies to Luke. Well, um, you say Russia doesn't feel the need to take these covert steps. I think my contention would be that she doesn't need to take them. There's enough going on in the world in all these fora and with all these world leaders uh, that we could get back to a much more constructive path if the Russians wanted to take it, I fear. Uh, reinforced by what Luke's been saying, uh, that President Putin just doesn't want to take it for the reasons uh, Luke gave. But um, I think P permanent five membership is a very good forum. I would like to see us all do uh, even more uh, in the P5 space. I think it's very difficult at the moment and it's not a panacea, uh, but I do think it's a very good forum for discrete uh, discussion of some very serious uh, issues. Uh, those issues include nuclear. You know, it's no coincidence that the P5 uh, are the world's um, permitted nuclear uh, powers under the NPT. Uh, but it also enables us to have discussions about uh, fundamental uh, other things going on in the world, e.g. Syria uh, and Libya and um, cyber. Um, I do... Um, I do worry, as I said, that the Russians uh, might just not want to uh, come into that discussion, uh, but I think we should be able to discuss things like chemical weapons at P5 uh, and hopefully uh, use that uh, in a sensible way. Uh, and then I think it would be nice to think that there would be more people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. Um, there are a number of those, but I think at the moment when we are seeing uh, the Russian state in Beagle itself uh, by all these routes into illegitimate activity, uh, I suspect that might be uh, a hard one. Uh, but I think global health as ever is actually quite a good uh, issue, as with the Chinese, uh, to put scientists and experts in direct touch with each other. So you try and take government out of the equation, you try and reduce the temptation. Uh, and um, we've all got some very serious global health problems to think about. In addition to COVID, there are things like antimicrobial uh, resistance. So I think, again, if, if the Russians wanted uh, to come into those discussions, we'd be pleased to see them 
Uh, so I, I would just say very, very briefly, I'll say the depressing thing and then a the slightly more uplifting thing. I mean, the, the depressing thing, uh, I think, is that, that despite the ambassador's optimism, w which is perfectly kind of reasonable, I, I don't see Putin changing anytime soon. And, 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 and more than that, we now know, uh, following this kind of constitutional referendum in inverted commas, that, that essentially what, what will always looked to me like a dictatorship has, has become a dictatorship and Putin will stay in power uh, potentially until 2036, well into his early 80s. I imagine that Donald Trump and Boris Johnson may have left the stage by then and Putin will be the last man standing, the last person standing. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, I think we have to go back to 1947. We have to go back to George Kennan. We, we have to go back to containment or neo-containment, where if, if, if Russia is not going to be a rational actor on the world stage, then I'm afraid it, 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 it's, it's going to be kind of pragmatic containment until, until things improve. I mean, all I, my, my positive is that we, ha we do have to separate the, this particular regime of 65-year-old or 65, 60-something 60 KGB men who have become very, very rich from the Russian people. I mean, R Russia is a great country um, with a wonderful theatrical, literary, artistic, intellectual, tradition and, and actually the big victims from, from all this are, are not Americans or Brits, that, that they are the Russians themselves. And, and there are um, very many young Russians who want something different. They want something more plural, more democratic, more, more modern. Uh, and, and, yeah, and I suspect their day will come. Uh, I mean, P Putin may wish to rule forever, but um, he, he won't and he can't. Uh, and at some stage, that there may be a, a still a intrinsically Russian Russia, but a more reasonable and productive partner down the road. Well, Luke and Madam Ambassador, I think that's a fantastic note to end on, uh, recognizing that, that we do have difficult times here in monitor, monitoring and responding to influence activities, but, but that behind these are, are real people just trying to live out their daily lives. Um, so we, it's upon us to be discerning um, in calling out those influence activities, to be honest about our own vulnerabilities, um, and to work, back, work together to push back um, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when lines are crossed. So um, I just wanted to thank you both for your time and, and Heather for the opportunity to work on this report. It's been really fascinating to look um, not only in the transatlantic space, but, but in Asia Pacific um, and to compare uh, what's going on in, in those two regions um, to come up with some real meaningful lessons. I take away from this conversation that we're only at the beginning and that we have a lot of work to do um, to get better at, at responding to activities in this space. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you both so much for your time and um, everybody please, please check out our report and um, and let us know what you think.